The Third Amendment of the United States is the least legally challenged, cited, and simplest and clearest worded amendment within the Bill of Rights. While it may be viewed as an archaic protection from having soldiers quartered in private homes and property, the amendment has a deeper meaning, history, and reason behind its enshrinement in the Bill of Rights. From its origins in early Georgian England, to the anti-quartering language being added to the English Bill of Rights, to the rebellion of the colonies when it came to the implementation of colonial quartering acts, and finally to debates between the Federalists and Anti-Federalists, the opposition to quartering soldiers ran deep within English Whig thought. The protection from quartering of soldiers was designed to prevent unfair taxation, seizure of private property, alleviate the fear of a standing occupying force, and ensuring, the guarantee, ensuring a guarantee to liberty and privacy. Opposition to the quartering of soldiers goes back as early as Henry I, London's Charter of 1130, which contained the passage, Let no one be billeted within the walls of the city, either of my household or by force of anyone else. These early legal charters were the major legal antecedents that led to precedence of opposition to quartering acts and a long-standing professional army. In early Georgian England, a standing professional army in peacetime was seen as a potential constitutional threat to privacy, liberty, and a potential opening to tyranny. The origins of the fear went back to the Stuart period during the time known as the Restoration Monarchy. The Restoration Monarchy had used the army to enhance the crown's power and implemented unpopular royal policies by quartering troops on those towns and cities it perceived as being factitious. Furthermore, the army was quartered in towns and cities that the monarchy believed to be hostile to the legitimacy and power of the Hanoverian secession. Continued fear over the quartering of soldiers and displeasures over the trampling of rights, the people in 1682 presented an English petition of right in which they humbly pray that quarter troops be removed. Furthermore, in 1689, in the English Bill of Rights, defended the ouster of King James II for, among other things, subverting the laws and liberties of this kingdom. By raising and keeping a standing army within the kingdom in a time of peace and quartering soldiers contrary to law. In fact, immediately after the Glorious Revolution of 1689, Parliament enacted the Mutiny Act, which forbade quartering of troops in private homes without the owner's consent. Within the English Bill of Rights, there were elements that influenced and were added to the American Bill of Rights. There was a distinct link linkage between opposition to standing armies and to quartering of troops. In 1735, during the parliamentary debate that preceded the vote on the size of the army for the coming year, it was argued that a standing army was a bad thing, dangerous to the king and to the liberties of the people, not to be kept up, much less augmented. In the 18th century, unlike today's respect and reverence for professional military service members, there was a strong distrust of the professional soldier. Within England, one of the serious issues of trust stemmed from the fact that at best, professional soldiers were viewed as merely mercenaries, prepared to fight for whomever paid them the most. As in the War for Independence, the British frequently hired soldiers of fortune to help wage their wars. The citizen population felt that the soldiers thus lacked a sense of civic patriotic duty which anti-army writers argued could be only found in a citizen militia. Consequently, a professional army offered but a dubious guarantee for the preservation of political and religious liberties. Presented as an alternative, it was suggested that a citizen militia should be the primary defense of security force during times of peace. In England, the defense was provided by the Fayed, a military to which able-bodied men owed service. Those who were called up served locally for short durations and provided their own provisions. This was also a common process in colonial America. One of the final reasons that there was a great opposition to the quartering of soldiers was that the citizenry saw it as a violation of their privacy. 
Blackstone stated that the law of England has so particular and tender regard for the immunity of a man's house that it stills in his castle and will never be sufficient to be violated with impunity. In 1604, judge and jurist Sir Edward Coke, while rendering a ruling known as Seaman's case, instilled into the common law understanding of domus suus circus est tissusudium, refugium, or everyone's house is his safest refuge, or more modernly quoted as every man's house is his castle. Furthermore, British Prime Minister William Pitt explained that the poorest man may be in his cottage bid defiance to all the forces of the crown. It may be frail, its roof may shake, the wind may blow through it, the storm may enter and the rain may enter, but the King of England cannot enter. If the British Crown or Parliament, for that matter, had the ability to quarter soldiers in any home they wished at any time, then the Englishman would lose his cherished right of privacy. Resistance to the quartering of troops started in early colonial America in New York's 1683 Charter of Liberties and Privileges contained the initial anti-quartering provisions in colonial American. No freeman shall be compelled to receive any mariners or soldiers into his house and there sufficient them sojourn against their wills provided always it be not in the time of actual war within this providence. The colonies, just like the early English citizenry, had been enduring quartering even before the 1700s. Each time the British government launched a significant military operation in North America, it brought along quartering problems. Civilians in Massachusetts and Connecticut complained about the quartering of soldiers in private homes as early as King Philip's War. In fact, in 1756, John Campbell, Earl of London, complained that Americans cited rights and privileges while opposing his efforts at quartering troops in homes at nearly every turn. The quartering of British soldiers in colonial America took root as a widespread phenomena during the French and Indian War. The war had required a dramatic increase in the number of British soldiers stationed in the colonies. In response to this influx, Parliament passed the Quartering Acts in 1765, as it found that the Mutiny Act did not apply to the Americas. The Act provided that American colonists were required to bear the financial burden of housing, supplying, and feeding British troops. Aside from the traditional distrust of the standing army, soldiers were unpopular for more tangible reasons as well, owing to the impact they had on everyday colonial life. The colonists did not build barracks as barracks were widely associated with military tyranny. This was not a unique American view. Barracks were not built in England either. Traditionally, troops in England, as well as in America, frequently were quartered in inns and taverns as paying guests. This solution provided unsatisfactory for all concerned, but especially for the innkeepers, since military guests had a tendency to leave damage and unpaid or underpaid bills, and often deterred other, more profitable clientele. If they could not be really readily quartered in establishments such as an inn or tavern, then the colony was required to provide them with sufficient housing in either barns, stables, or unoccupied housing. Most communities dislike having soldiers among them for deeply felt reasons. Soldiers could be and were disorderly, violent, and thieving. Some had a tendency to father illegitimate children, putting pressure on the local poor relief structures. Reverend John Cleveland once observed that profane swearing seems to be the natural language of the regulars, and further lamented that the soldiers were addicted to gaming, robbery, theft, whoring, and bad company keeping. Lastly, neither the regular British troops or their officers observed the Sabbath. However, a standing army with a professional soldier could be an even greater bane when they were at ideological odds with members of the community upon which they had been quartered. One of the main concerns of the colonists, and eventually founding fathers, was the continued presence of a large foreign military force that they found was unanswerable and uncontrollable by the local colonists or their legislative bodies in the Americas. With the passing of the Quartering Act in 1765, the, par the parliamentary action only added fuel to an already politically volatile situation. 
raising fears of parliamentary tyranny and generating constitutional questions about par parliamentary versus local legislative authority. This led John Dickerson to express the view, if the British Parliament has legal authority to issue an order that we shall furnish a single article for the troops here and to compel obedience to that order, they have the same right to issue an order for us to supply those troops with arms, clothes, and every necessity and compel obedience to that order also. In short, to lay any burdens they please upon us. What is this but taxing us at a certain sum and leaving to us only the manner of raising it? How is this mo mode more tolerable than the Stamp Act? Francis Bernard, the royal governor of Massachusetts, articulated the colonial legal strategy of resistance. There are no barracks in the town and therefore, by act of parliament, they must be quartered in the public houses. But no one will keep a public house on such terms, and there will be no public houses and then the governor and council must hire barns, outhouses, etc. for them. But nobody is obliged to let them, nobody will let them, nobody will dare to let them. The troops are forbid to quarter themselves in any other manner than according to the Act of Parliament under severe penalties. But they can't quarter themselves according to the Act, and therefore they must leave town or seize on quarters contrary to the Act. When they do this, when they invade property contrary to the Act of Parliament, we may resist them with the law on our side. Opposition to the funding and quartering of soldiers led to the New York Assembly to refuse to pass legislation that recognizes the legitimacy of the British Quartering Act in the colony. For its transgression, the Assembly was suspended a parliamentary restraint by the Parliamentary Restraining Act. While New York eventually provided quartering and supplying the troops, it never acknowledged the authority of Parliament to pass quartering laws that applied to the colony. In response to colonial unrest, Parliament passed new quartering acts in 1774. The colonials regarded this quartering act as even more offensive than the one in 1765 and labeled it as one of the infamous intolerable acts. This updated version of the acts granted quartering directly in private residences. In response to this, the First Continental Congress passed a resolution condemning the updated quartering acts, declaring that raising and keeping a standing army within these colonies in a time of peace, unless it be consent of the provincial legislator, is illegal, pernicious, and dangerous, that every statute for quartering and supplying troops within the said colonies is illegal and void. The opposition to quartering of soldiers was such, that a prominent, was such a prominent issue that it was included in the Declaration of Independence. He has kept among us in time of peace standing armies without the consent of our legislatures. He has effected to render the military independent and superior to the civil power. The Third Amendment reads as follows, No soldier shall be, in time of peace, be quartered in any house without the consent of the owner, nor in time of war, but in a manner to be prescribed by law. The events leading up to the American Revolution persuaded the colonists that there was a close connection between restrictions on quartering troops and the maintenance of constitutional liberty. And unlike some of their constitutional assertions, they were able to identify the resistance to quartering of troops with a long-standing English libertarian demand that had apparently triumphed after the Glorious Revolution. During the debates between the Federalists and Anti-Federalists, Samuel Chase objected that Congress will have a right to quarter soldiers in our private houses, not only in time of war, but also in time of peace. And the Federal Farmer categorically demanded that no soldier be quartered on the citizens without their consent, and made no exceptions for quartering controlled by law in times of war. Their stance was that, the, that many of the state's constitutions already held anti-quartering acts, and that the federal government should not have the power to override those constitutionals and force federal troops on their homes. Although the anti-federalists did not ultimately prevail in the debate over the ratification of the Constitution, they did give voice to a widespread concern of many issues, including that of quartering. 
The underlying values found within the Third Amendment are the separations of powers provision, much like the three branches of government. The founders realized that the military needed to be under the control of the civilian government and also protects the homeowner's right to privacy from the government's prying eyes. Justice Joseph's story had this to say about the Third Amendment. Its plain objective is to secure the perfect enjoyment of that great right of the common law, that a man's house should be his own castle, privileged against all civil and military intrusion. Justice Berger clarified the separation of power and privacy argument saying, the military must be subjected to civilian control and that the government cannot intrude into private homes without good reason. The philosophy embodied in the Third Amendment is derived from the American colonist fear of British military power. With professional standing military housed and stationed on bases throughout the country, the amendment no longer seems necessary. However, the Third Amendment still embodies the same basic principles, that the military must be subject to civilian control and that the government cannot intrude into private homes without good reason. The Third Amendment further understands that property is an essential component or protection of individual liberty, and that liberty increases in fullness of the more firmly we protect property against government restrictions or invasions.